Good morning, afternoon, and evening, and welcome to everyone to our third season of Global Insights, a live interactive panel discussion which sheds light on big questions currently facing policymakers and planners worldwide. Global Insights features experts from leading institutions in the study of international affairs, including the Balsillie School in Canada, the University of Warwick in the UK, the American University in the US, and other partners. Today's live stream production is entitled U.S. Leadership in the World Under Biden. My name is Anne Fitzgerald. I'm the director of the Balsillie School of International Affairs, and I'm delighted to be serving as today's moderator for the session. A warm welcome to all participants in the audience. Um, we would invite you to direct any questions to the panelists using the Q&A function of your Zoom page, and we will do our best to put your questions back to the panelists, particularly during the latter part of the session. Before we begin, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. For those in the audience who are tuning in from outside of Canada, one of the actions we take here in Canada to advance our reconciliation between settler and indigenous peoples is to reflect on our relationship with the land and the continuous process of colonization that deeply impacts our work. Acknowledging the land is a process of deliberately naming that this is indigenous land and that Indigenous peoples have rights to this land. The Balsili School is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on either side of the Grand River, which is on the traditional territory of the Atawandaran, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. It is particularly important that we here at the school acknowledge this land in all that we do, including Global Insights. To start off today's conversation, I'd like to turn to our distinguished panel. George Luffelman is Leverhulme Early Career Fellow at the University of Warwick in the UK. He is the author of American Grand Strategy Under Obama, Competing Discourses. His current research examines the political impact of populist security narratives under the Trump presidency. Roy Norton currently serves as adjunct assistant professor at the University of Waterloo and a fellow at the Balsillie School. During his career with the Canadian Foreign Service, Roy was posted to the United States four times, twice to Canada's embassy in Washington, as Minister of Congressional Affairs and Media Relations, as Consul General in Detroit, and as Consul General in Chicago. He was also Canada's Chief of Protocol based at Global Affairs in Canada, in Ottawa. Sarah Snyder teaches at the American University School of International Service in Washington, DC. She is the author of two award-winning books, From Selma to Moscow, How Human Rights Activists Transform US Foreign Policy, and Human Rights Activism and the End of the Cold War, A Transnational History of the Helsinki Network. Thank you again, everyone, for your insights and being with us here today. So I'd like to kick off our discussion by taking a few minutes just to reflect on US foreign policy under the Trump administration. Sarah, in what ways did uh, President Trump's foreign policy represent any break from the past precedent? Uh, more specifically, how would you evaluate the Trump administration's approach to human rights? And thank you so much for that question and for inviting me to participate in this fascinating panel. Um, I'm gonna just start off by taking the sort of general piece of your question first. Um, in what ways did Trump's foreign policy break with precedent? Because I think that this is actually quite significant because he broke with precedent in so many ways, um, but in foreign policy in really two key ways. One um, was that his foreign policy really represented a shift away from the sort of four decades approach that the United States had taken to its place in the world since the end of the Cold War. But also it was a shift away from the multi-generational approach that the United States had taken um, to its international leadership of the world since the Second World War. Um, and I would say that the Trump administration broke with these precedents because it really questioned the tenets upon which these approaches rested. Um, and, and sort of in questioning these tenets, it actively sought to overturn the traditional place that US policymakers had hoped um, to sort of play in the world. And this is because the beliefs that served as the foundation of the Trump administration's foreign policy 
really represented a break from past precedent. These included things like the rejection of the international order, opposition to immigration, opposition to free trade agreements, um, a sort of conviction that U.S. foreign policy should be low cost or even free to the American people, um, a distrust of American allies, skepticism about international organizations, and a rejection of the idea of American exceptionalism. Um, thinking about human rights more specifically, I would say that the extent to which human rights were a part of the Trump administration's agenda, um, we can see that in terms of the championing of religious freedom, um, that particularly people like Secretary of State Mike Pompeo did, um, their opposition to human trafficking and their efforts to release um, Americans who they believed were wrongly imprisoned overseas. Um, but I wouldn't say that these elements really make up a human rights policy. Um, I would say that the administration pursued an interest-based rather than a values-based foreign policy. Um, it had a very transactional approach to foreign policy in that it saw sort of the world as a zero-sum game and the United States had to be a winner all the time. Um, and advancing human rights or championing human rights might not have achieved that. Um, and then finally, I would say we can see a kind of general unwillingness, um, particularly by the former president, to lecture other governments on their internal affairs. Um, so again, all of this is a break from the past precedent of US foreign policy. Thanks so much, Sarah. George, over to you. So President Trump laid out a foreign policy vision of America first. What will be the guiding theme for America's role in the world under a Biden administration? Yes, uh, so thank you very much for the question. Also for the invitation, it's great to be here with all and discussing these topics. Um, before I come to Biden, maybe just circling back quick to what actually was America first, because I think there, it was really quite a mixed bag. I don't quite think we can think of it as sort of like a coherent and consistent Trump doctrine, but there was various elements. One was a nationalist populist rhetoric of America's allies as a source of weakness. Everybody is ripping off the United States. Uh, free trade deals are synonymous with devastating the American economy. International organizations are bad. The EU is a foe. And so that I think was very much on a sort of rhetorical level. Then we had classical, I would say, neoconservative elements, staunch support for Israel, like relocating the US embassy to Jerusalem, a very militarized discourse and emphasis of global military supremacy. And then I would also say something of a vulgar realism, if you want to call it that, you know, emphasis of American economic power, military power, but completely detached from any commitment to values. And where these elements didn't quite um, amount to like a coherent, consistent doctrine, they had one thing in common, which is the hostility towards a liberal international order, and in particular, America's leadership role in security terms, in economic terms, of that liberal international order. And I think what the Biden administration will do first and foremost is to essentially say that we are back not only as a member, but as a leader of that liberal international order, and that a grand strategy of liberal hegemony, which commanded, as Sarah said, this bipartisan consensus and really like a multi-decades consensus, is in some form back with the, with the Biden administration and that they're seeking again to constructively also respond to global challenges like the COVID pandemic, like climate change, and what you know um, Obama would refer to as burden sharing. So this idea that actually allies and partners of the US are not a drain, are not a weakness, but they are a source of American strength and of, of America's success in international affairs. Thanks very much, Roy, over to you. How interested are Americans in a restored US leadership role? The Chicago Council on Global Affairs uh, polls consistently on that subject. Uh, making them a, a reliable and reputable reporter, I think. Uh, over the course of the uh, last four years, the Trump years, uh, they showed that consistently about 70% of Americans thought that it was in the United States' interests to pursue an active role in the world. Uh, now, that said, and that was higher incidentally than, than it was uh, at any point during Obama's second term. So Trump America firstism didn't succeed in, in uh, fully promoting or instilling a, a sense that America should withdraw or become self-isolated. At the same time, as Georg has, has implied, 
um, America firstism did surface uh, a sense among Americans that uh, brought brought to the fore a sense among Americans that the country is uh, put upon, taken advantage of, uh, that um, uh, others routinely uh, cheat, uh, that they're free riders and the like, and that sentiment uh, clearly continues to exist. So I'd say that on the one hand, Americans will welcome President Biden um, uh, toning down the drama uh, and uh, ending conflict uh, with uh, US allies and friends. Uh, they'll welcome US efforts to problem solve, uh, to convene and, uh, and serve, uh, uh, lend US good offices. Um, they likely can be sold on definitions of American interests that uh, are more nuanced than the zero sum uh, for us to win, you have to lose approach of Donald Trump. On the other hand, they're absolutely uninterested in war, uh, in anything that could lead to a significant uh, US uh, military engagement abroad uh, beyond where they are now. There are reasons why Donald Trump and Mike Pompeo in their last days repeatedly said that they're the first administration in a long time not to lead the United States uh, into a new war. They're not going to obsess about foreign aid spending, providing that Biden isn't seeking lots of infusion, uh, but they're very preoccupied with domestic matters. They're acutely aware of the uh, profundity of the problems that, um, that the administration faces. So um, they'll endorse uh, efforts to achieve reforms at multilateral institutions. Uh, if you like Trump objectives, but, but not pursuing Trump's you know, incoherent and aggressive approaches. Um, I don't think uh, if it meant delays in, in vaccinating any Americans that they would be much uh, supportive of US leadership on COVID uh, that, uh, that involved uh, allowing others to go first. Uh, so uh, lots of interest, but uh, tempered somewhat, I mm -hmm. think, in, uh, in going forward. Well, Roy, thank you for that. Can I flip the question on its back a little bit and, and stay with you for a moment? Is the world itself looking for a restored US leadership? Or has in some uh, respects, uh, has the world moved on? I'd say that for many leaders, uh, there are continuing concerns about the consistency of US enthusiasm, uh, the durability uh, of US willingness to engage. Uh, and, and that's going to take some effort to rebuild in terms of US credibility and plausibility in, in that regard. Um, and that could serve as a bit of a break on scope for the United States to engage as fully as many in the, in the Biden administration might be inclined. At the same time, um, clearly no country stepped forward uh, during the four years of virtual absence uh, in a constructive way uh, and, and provided coordination, brokerage, convening and the like. And so, Obviously, there's a vacuum, uh, and everyone is acutely aware of that vacuum. It wasn't filled, and it's unlikely that anybody else will fill it. There's absolutely a demand for the United States to be engaged in trying to shape with its friends and allies some sort of coherent policy on China, uh, because there are great concerns uh, in the world about Chinese behavior and policies, and uh, everybody is kind of at loose ends. Uh, as, to, as to how to proceed. There are major problems in multilateral organizations, some of which were caused by the United States, but not exclusively. Uh, they're not going to be fixed, however, without the United States being fully engaged in trying to find a solution. There are regional issues. You know, Greece and Turkey look as if they might be poised for some sort of conflict. The EU can't resolve that. Russia can't resolve it. But because the United States is the leader of NATO and both of those countries are NATO members, maybe U.S. good offices can help. We witnessed, and you know this better than anybody else being an expert on Ethiopia, um, we witnessed a major conflict uh, in Africa's second most populous country uh, late last year. The United States uh, seemed to me to be totally absent from any effort to drive uh, a resolution of that. Uh, there's potential for conflict over the Grand Renaissance Dam, 
uh, Trump's contribution was to imply that maybe Egypt would have to blow it up. I mean, surely there's a more constructive role that the United States uh, can play on something like that. Likewise, on climate change, um, you know, the list is 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 long. Um, if the United States doesn't re-engage the JCPOA, uh, then uh, the Middle East uh, doesn't stand much of a chance of becoming uh, safer than it is today, and it's arguably less safe than it was uh, when the United States left the JCPOA. So lots of of uh, scope, um, lots of interest in constructive U.S. leadership, I would say. Brilliant, Roy, thank you. Sarah, can I pick up on one of Roy's points about durability and endurance? So what do you think might endure under Obama and what will change with the administration? Under, under Biden. Under Biden, thank you. Yes. No, I think, I think we're all gonna <laughs> have a few um, sort of tongue uh, in that respect. Uh, so I think, you know, in my first uh, points, I emphasized how much Trump represented a break from past precedent. But certainly there are some precedents um, that I think reveal, um, as, as Roy was mentioning, the origins of some of his policies in a sort of weariness about American military engagement overseas. And so I think particularly, you know, if we think about some of his policies as being cyclical um, and looking back at the example of, say, the weariness that the United States felt after the First World War, um, when there was a real reluctance to engage with the world, um, I think that we will see um, that the United States, the people um, of the United States, um, that their desire to stay out of foreign wars, I think will lead to hesitation in the Biden administration um, about a sort of what an over-dependence on, mil on military tools to achieve US foreign policy objectives um, can lead to um, and, and the need to think more about how to build and maintain American public support for their po foreign policy goals and maybe recalibrate the tools that they use to achieve them. Um, in most other respects, I think we will see a new approach to foreign policy under the Biden administration in that um, the Biden administration will use different tactics to achieve its objectives. I think we'll see efforts, um, and, and, and Roy has alluded to some of this, to re-energize the United States relationships with its allies, um, to return the United States to international leadership, to invest in diplomacy and in diplomats. Um, the State Department is in dire need of, of an investment, and I think the signals are that the Biden administration will make it, um, that he will work to rebuild American credibility, um, that he will work with and try to enhance the place of civil society um, in the international community, that he will rejoin international agreements, and we've already seen that um, in some of the executive orders that he signed yesterday, um, and that he will work to revive American exceptionalism. I think if we think about the contrast from his inaugural address yesterday to Trump's four years ago, um, it's very clear they have a different vision of the place of the United States in the world. Thanks, Sarah. George, how much, and, and I will mention his name correctly this time um, in, the, in the correct question, Obama, how much of the Obama doctrine will mm. continue with Joe Biden, in your view? My, my hunch would be that a lot of the practices and the rhetoric of the Obama doctrine will make a return with Biden, um, which I think is also not unproblematic because the central challenge that I see for the Obama doctrine was sort of formulate a response to this question, what is the role of America as the global power in the world in a world that is increasingly becoming post-American in the sense that we have a diffusion of power, that we have a rise of, you know, the rest, the rise of China, of a revisionist Russia. And so this, this heyday of American unipolarity of America as the hyperpower, those are clearly behind us. And I think we can see the split in Obama when he constantly referred to American exceptionalism and he very much invoked the rhetoric of American hegemony, liberal hegemony, American leadership. But then a lot of the policies were rather designed to lessen the burden and commitments of that leadership role to allow the United States to revitalize its economy at home. And so we have outcomes like the leading from behind intervention in Libya, right? We have outcomes like the Syria intervention where Obama gives an address that clearly states we're not the policemen of the world, but with very limited means like special forces and drones, we can make a difference if only a modest difference. 
And I think this, this tension between this aspiration to fulfill the ideal of American exceptionalism with a very pragmatic sense of also the limitations of American power and influence in the world, I think this will make a comeback with, with Joe Biden in particular in terms of military restraint. Um, I think it was also interesting in that sense that uh, Michelle Flournoy did not become Secretary of Defense because I think she was one of the card carrying members of what Ben Rhodes, uh, so Chairman referred to as the blob. Uh, somebody very habitually associated with military calls for action. And I think this is exactly the kind of policy that Biden as vice president already opposed during the Afghanistan war when he positioned himself against the supporters of COIN, the Center of New American Security and Flona and others uh, included focusing, Biden wanting to focus on a very limited counterterrorism approach. And so I think a lot of these impulses for military restraint, for burden sharing, for trying to get more allies and partners involved, the Europeans to shoulder more of the burden of European security in the terms of Russia. I, I would imagine a lot of this will make a comeback, but also we talk about, for example, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which has now a new name, but I think that the United States will try to rejoin um, these efforts, for example, and also show that this focus on liberal engagement, cooperative engagement that was such an emphasis of Obama is, is back with Biden. Thank you for that. Um, so throughout his term, President Tr Trump has really shunned uh, many of the US's traditional alliances. And these last four years have not been easy for allies of the United States. So Roy, I'd like to put a question to you on this issue and ask you if friendly countries have a role to play in making it possible for the US to reassert its leadership in the world? Do we ever. Um, Biden needs wins and friends of the United States should be focused on helping him get them. Um, we didn't want, none of us uh, over the last four years wanted to validate Trumpism, uh, to encourage him. Uh, he would have pocketed any gains that he was handed and probably would have turned around and humiliated the leaders that, uh, that uh, handed them to him. But the crux of the issue, it seems to me, is that we've all seen America first, Trumpism. Uh, it's ugly. Uh, it's hard to imagine that our world could have survived another four years of it. Uh, we don't want it back. And we have a role to play in trying to ensure that it doesn't return. We mustn't delude ourselves into thinking that somehow it's been vanquished for good. Hence, our responsibility as friends and allies of the United States to help Biden succeed. We should want Americans to perceive during the course of his presidency that it's possible for a rational, uh, reasonable, uh, responsible, moderate, modest president and administration to uh, advance United States interests while making the world a better place simultaneously. Uh, and if we don't do that, the downside risk is that we all will have contributed to um, a return, maybe as early as 2024, of that which we can't bear and we'll have a lot of responsibility to share as a result. George, um, turning to Europe, so for Trump, NATO was obsolete, the European Union was a foe, and Germany was very bad. So what does Biden's victory mean for Europe and the future of the transatlantic partnership? <clears throat> Thank you. Well, for one thing, and I think we've already alluded to this, the, the atmospherics, the, the optics will be immeasurably better between Biden and European leaders um, and the EU simply because Biden represents a fundamentally different worldview when it comes to the value of allies and partners. And in many things, the European Union and the European allies are still the, the natural partner uh, for the United uh, States. When we talk about, for example, you know, reforming international taxation and uh, tax havens when it comes uh, to international property rights, um, the potential regulation of social media companies and so forth. But a lot of the policy issues, the bones of contention between Trump and the Europeans have not gone away. Um, the underinvestment into security uh, and defense in my home country, Germany, is, is first uh, among that, with not hitting the NATO target of uh, 2%. Um, 
Europe still not really having developed a joint strategic culture um, where they are able to project military power. Where does Europe stand in relations to China? Do they want to come on board a somewhat of an anti-China coalition with the Biden administration? Um, well, in that case, uh, Merkel essentially closing the deal on a Chinese-European investment agreement basically two days before the Trump administration came and kind of sent a terrible signal in, in that vein. So um, I think it will be difficult uh, negotiations. Um, I think there is a collective sigh of relief that Trump is gone among European um, capitals. Um, I don't think that Biden is a particular supporter or friend of Brexit. Um, I think he just kicked out the Winston Churchill bust, which has uh, led to the usual outrage in the right-wing press here uh, in Europe. Um, but I, I expect that Biden will offer partnership, but he will also want to see something in return from the Europeans. And I think it is especially up to Paris and Berlin and Brussels to, to deliver in some form. Sarah, you're a, a human rights expert. Do you see human rights as um, an agenda that will move forefront into the uh, Biden's foreign policy approach? Well, as a historian, I'm always a bit cautious about making predictions, um, but I think that the signals are very strong. Um, one, throughout the campaign, Biden said that human rights was going to be at the core of his foreign policy. And since he has been elected, I think we've seen that borne out thus far in the appointments that he made. Um, in Antony Blinken's um, confirmation hearings to become Secretary of State, he echoed the sentiment. He said that democracy and human rights would be back at the center of American foreign policy. Um, I think we can also see this in the appointment of Samantha Power um, to be the head of the U.S. Agency for International Development. And I think that it may also suggest that the, the Biden administration is sort of thinking about broadening its conception of human rights and maybe deepening the ways in which it considers human rights in its foreign policy. Um, that said, as, as Roy mentioned earlier, Biden has a lot of domestic challenges um, and even internationally, um, I think that COVID and, and likely the place of the US in the world economy will, be, um, will warrant far more of his attention in these early months than say, um, some human rights issues that, that activists have long hoped that the United States would become more engaged with. The world in 2021 is a pretty unhappy place at the moment. There are enormous global governance challenges uh, that Biden and his administration will have to face. COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, great power rivalry, um, you know, electoral disputes, the, 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 the list is endless. Roy, what are the biggest challenges for this administration in exercising leadership? Well, they're heavily domestic, uh, intense partisan divides in the United States. Most Republicans will disparage anything that the new president tries to do internationally. Um, narrow congressional margins necessitate that anything that he does likely has to be done by executive order, and we've seen how uh, how uh, that's not very durable. Uh, significant ideological divides uh, within the Democratic Party itself uh, means that, that it's not clear uh, what priorities he's, he's going to feel um, comfort uh, in pursuing. Uh, as Sarah has just reiterated, um, domestic priorities are such that, that um, there's a, a big constituency of, you know, let's take care of things at home first crowd. Um, in taking care of some of those things, however, um, uh, think of, of uh, addressing race issues, of addressing uh, democratic deficit issues, the U.S. actually can do a lot to bolster its soft power uh, internationally. The biggest challenges, I think, come from the fact that um, a number of powerful adversaries of the United States, China and Russia in particular, um, rather liked Trumpism. Um, they benefited from, uh, you know, China thinks the United States is in a state of irreversible decline. Um, they're not going to do anything uh, to uh, help buttress the United States' standing over the next period of time. They, Russia, um, Iran, North Korea, all perceive that the United States has been at war with itself. 
uh, and has uh, you know, been doing their work, as it were. Um, they would welcome probably a return to America first and Trumpism if it meant more internal conflict and more disarray and uh, reduced US standing in the world. So I think the Biden administration is gonna to have to be very alert to the potentiality that um, uh, they will throw obstacles in his way uh, with the objective of undermining his credibility at home. Sarah, is support for human rights something that unites Congress or is this a partisan agenda? Is there, does it, does it open up opportunities for cooperation in the new Congress? I want to um, answer that, but first I just want to amplify something that Roy said, um, and this come sort of, it, it made me think about some of the language that President Biden used yesterday in his inaugural address about, you know, that the United States will not reclaim its place in the world through the example of its power, but through the power of its example. And I do think that even in the desire to focus on domestic issues, the way in which the Biden administration addresses some of these issues um, could be very powerful. Um, and, and reverberate um, in many different communities. Um, you know, this is something that, that we've seen in the past, the ways that say Woodrow Wilson's language about self-determination inspired um, people suffering under colonialism um, to, to rise up. And so I think that the ways in which the Biden administration particularly tackles um, issues of racial justice um, and economic justice in the United States could have a very powerful um, impact beyond the borders of the United States. On this issue of bipartisanship, you know, it has not been the case historically in the United States that support for human rights was traditionally a partisan issue. Um, even if I would say that members of the different political parties might have agreed, disagreed on which rights uh, to champion, you know, some would have said, say, the right to private property or the right to practice one's religion, and, and others might have um, focused on other types of human rights. And they also might have disagreed about how best to protect human rights overseas. Um, you know, the Reagan administration famously claims that it, it preferred quiet diplomacy. Um, some, some other US presidents have liked to be very strident and strong in their rhetoric. Um, but the sort of fundamental value that the United States, that its country was sort of founded on the ideas of protecting rights has motivated American politicians from both parties um, to see both the protection of rights at home and championing them overseas as sort of a core value of the United States. Um, and we can see this if we look at sort of who some of the strongest voices on human rights have been within the US political system. You know, we can point to Democrats historically, someone like Tom Lantos, um, who was a Democratic member of the House um, for whom a uh, human rights caucus is now named, but also today, Tom Malinowski, a relatively new member of the House um, who served in the Obama administration in the State Department, um, but also Republicans, people like um, Senator John McCain or Marco Rubio, um, they all have spoken out about human rights very powerfully. And in fact, we saw in the last four years that one of the areas in which Senate Republicans most often disagreed with the president was on the question of human rights, um, questions about sanctions on governments that were violating human rights, and about the extent to which the United States should be selling um, arms to uh, countries where uh, members of Congress felt that they couldn't be assured that these weapons wouldn't be used uh, to violate either their own citizens or the citizens of other countries. And so I think that with the shift in administration, there's actually an enormous opportunity for meaningful bipartisan work on human rights. And given that this is something that Biden has really said that he wants to emphasize, I would think it would be an easy way um, for some sort of early successes, the wins that Roy is saying that the United States needs, um, that human rights would offer a significant opportunity to achieve those. George, turning to China, the Trump administration identified China as a strategic rival and focused on ideological and geopolitical competition with Beijing. Will, in your view, President Biden continue with this strategic course? Yes, um, very, very much so. And in fact, when there is one element of the American first policy platform that I think will endure, it is this emphasis on a strategic competition with China to essentially abandon this responsible stakeholder uh, model as uh, an illusion and is misguided that 
China is not seeking to integrate itself into a US-led Pax Americana, either regionally in the Asia Pacific um, or globally, but that um, China really tries to uh, promote its own model and tries to like model an international order after its own model of a um, authoritarian capitalist technocracy, um, if you will. And I think we've already seen, you know, statements by the incoming uh, Biden team, by uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, by Lloyd Austin, who were lauding this tougher approach uh, on China under the Trump administration. Um, I think um, Austin has called it the greatest um, threat in form of a national state or nation state um, to the United States, that is China. I think we have an emerging bipartisan consensus um, on this issue. I mean, even under the Trump administration, one thing that never Trumpers, um, Steve Bannon, GOP establishment types and national populists could all agree on was sort of this paradigm of a new cold uh, war against China. I don't think all of that rhetoric will make a comeback. But even when we look to the Obama administration and we look to the pivot to Asia, discrimination of um, military, a soft military balancing against China under involvement of Australia and Japan, renewing alliances, new strategic partnerships with ASEAN, with India, um, a Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement that was inofficially known as anyone but Beijing. Um, then I think this course actually predates Trump, has been accelerated, has been amplified under Trump and will very much focus um, I think a lot of the US foreign policy and national security attention. And uh, if I may use the opportunity for a shameless self plug, there's gonna be a new Routledge handbook on the US policy role in the Indo-Pacific edited by Wally Aslam, Oliver Turner, and Nicola Niemann. I'm contributing a chapter on American grand strategy where it's very much uh, the focus on exactly how is the strategic role in the Asia Pacific evolving with China very much looming as this presence in these proceedings. Um, so yeah, in, in, one, in one sentence, I think this, this tougher stance is, is here to stay, absolutely. Thanks very much. Okay, so with Democrats in control of Congress for at least the next two years, it seems that Biden has this incredible opportunity to not only pursue a bold foreign policy agenda, but also to pick up on some quick wins. So Sarah, what in your view will be the immediate steps on the human rights agenda and quick wins in this area? So some of the things that the Biden administration can do very quickly um, and that wouldn't they wouldn't necessarily need to, to pass new legislation to achieve um, would be things like disbanding Mike Pompeo's commission on unalienable rights. Um, and that's something that Blinken has already committed to do um, during his confirmation hearings. Also ending the politicization of the annual human rights country reports that the State Department is mandated um, to publish, um, rejoining the United Nations Human Rights Council speaking out about human rights abuses, um, not just in uh, countries that the United States perceives as its adversaries, places like China, um, but also speaking out about the human rights abuses of its allies, particularly um, the record of Saudi Arabia is something that's been very neglected uh, by the Trump administration, but then also condemning threats to democracy, um, talking about um, ways in which we see restrictions on freedom of press, freedom of speech, um, in particular, um, the threats to democracy in Hong Kong would be something that the Biden administration could be emphasizing. But I would say that none of these steps, uh, none of these potential quick wins will matter if they're seen as sort of empty in contrast to the record of the United States on human rights at home. Um, the United States has to, and I, I was very happy to see that in, um, in some of the executive orders that Biden signed yesterday that he's starting to do this, um, he has to address racial and religious discrimination in immigration. Um, he has to rebuff voter suppression. He needs to champion freedom of the press. He needs to reform the criminal justice system and he has to combat systemic racism. Um, too often in the United States, I think Americans like to see violations of human rights as something that happens overseas, it happens elsewhere. It's not something that Americans or the American government might engage in. Um, but the United States has to confront its domestic human rights problems. And it has to do that transparently mm -hmm. if the United States is really ever gonna, again, mm -hmm. be able to exert any moral leadership in the world. Um, I think that the United States path forward, um, the sort of rebuilding of its legitimacy, of its credibility, 
all of that will be bolstered if it does the real work to confront systemic racism at home. Thanks, Sarah. That, that unfortunately is not, not a quick win. That's not a quick win, but the work has to be done. If anything else um, will be meaningfully achieved, I think. Towards that end. Roy, what are your views on this? I agree with everything that Sarah said, as, but as she pointed out, some of it's heavy lifting and it's not going to happen uh, overnight. Restoring a lot of US soft power could be relatively easy, however, by being consultative and respectful, developing plans and uh, in true collaboration with, with partners, uh, they can go a long way. Uh, traditional friends and allies of the United States have been so brutalized over the last four years that simply by behaving appropriately, President Biden, Secretary Blinken, and the highly professional uh, new administration that's, that's taking office should be able to undo a lot of the damage. Um, if the U.S. demonstrates, in the case of Africa, for example, uh, a sincere interest, you know, Trump not only didn't travel there, but he disparaged it in the most derogatory terms imaginable. Um, you, know, you can begin, uh, imagine the beginning of a repairing of, of relationships there. Likewise, uh, in, the, in the Muslim world, um, Pew polling shows that the Arab street uh, is acutely aware of, of the discriminatory measures taken at home uh, by the uh, Trump administration against Muslims. We're talking about 24% of the world's population here. This won't be reversed overnight, but uh, the decision on DACA um, uh, 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 insofar as refugees, the, the decision on ending the effective travel ban on Muslims coming to the United States yesterday by executive order, all of that um, uh, will help. Uh, ending uh, trumped up, no pun intended, uh, reasons for vetoing or, or uh, not allocating congressionally approved foreign aid will, will help. Uh, instead of you know, methodically uh, trying to kill uh, multilateral organizations, which is what the Trump administration has done, turning their attention instead to reforming them collaboratively, uh, this is the sort of thing that will uh, uh, initiative and action that will help uh, restore U.S. credibility, I think. So there's lots of things that, that they can do to improve U.S. standing and leadership in the world. Not all of them difficult. Perhaps the easiest one is simply to end the off-putting swagger that we've all been subjected to uh, since January of 2017. George, one thing for sure is that Americans are fed up with decades of failed military interventions and endless wars. Actually, the US has been at war since 2001 and we see signs uh, that the government has been responding to this, certainly under Trump, pulling troops out of Somalia, bringing people home from uh, Afghanistan and elsewhere. Will Biden continue this? Will Biden bring the troops home? Mm -hmm. Um, I think yes, yes and no, um, because even Trump couldn't completely bring, you know, the troops home when we look to Afghanistan. But um, when Robert Gates served as Secretary of Defense under Obama, I think he said something along the lines of, if any American president should ever think about sending a large land army into Central Asia, he should have his head examined. And I think this paradigm will very much, uh, you know, is still valid and will stay true for the Biden administration, as I said before, um, even during the Afghanistan war, the height of the Afghanistan war, when American troops searched something like 100,000, Biden was never on board with the entire coin concept. So what I think we will see is very much continuity in terms of Obama era policies when we look to counterterrorism, predominantly carried out by small teams of special forces um, and drones of what we will think what we'll see, I think, in Syria might be actually um, an increase of the troop presence there in terms of also standing by um, the Kurds and making clear to both um, Turkey and Russia that uh, any kind of incursion there against the Kurds will meet with a U.S. Um, response. I, will, I would assume that Biden is the last president who would try to get back into Afghanistan. So I think very much the, the drawdown of U.S. forces will, uh, will continue. Um, obviously contingent on how negotiations with the Taliban and the Afghan government uh, play out. But I really think that Biden will want to close this chapter. 
And also, I think when we look to public opinion, when we look at public opinion polls, Roy mentioned the Chicago because of the national affairs, um, I think there is a clear weariness and wariness among the American populace to get out of these wars. When you know Trump criticized the US foreign policy establishment for producing this dismal track record of failed military interventions and losses in war, this wasn't just populism. This was a genuine reflection of a sizable proportion of the American uh, populace. And, of course, also many Trump voters who themselves maybe had relatives or sons or daughters who served in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, you know, Biden himself, his son, uh, Bo Biden, served in, in these wars. So I think there is a great deal of reticence um, among Joe Biden to get re-involved in these, in these especially large troop insertions into these, into these regions. At the same time, there is, I think, a clear eye, for example, on the threat potential of Iran, how Iran can dis uh, disrupt the neighborhood there. But I think what was called hegemony light or like a small footprint approach um, under the Obama doctrine when it comes to the application of military force, that will make a, that will make a return. And so in that, in that sense, I think, when we compare it to the Bush era military interventions, the troops will come home under Biden. Thanks so much. I want to turn to some of the questions coming in from the audience through different feeds I'm managing here. Roy, there's a lot of interest, not surprisingly, in the Keystone uh, Pipeline project. So um, tell us your thoughts on this. What's going to be the impact and uh, what does this say for Biden's foreign policy? Well, it's not the best start in terms of proving uh, consultativeness. Uh, because he acted on day one on an issue that's of major interest to Canada uh, in a way that um, disadvantages Canada's interests. At the same time, he'd signaled clearly that it, he was going to do it and probably that he wasn't persuadable uh, to, uh, to relent on that commitment. And so nobody here is terribly surprised. It, it's interesting that for an administration that is committed to science, as the new one is, as the old one wasn't, uh, it's not. It's certainly debatable as to as to um, uh, whether the science supports an end to Keystone uh, in terms of emissions that uh, uh, that uh, are issued by virtue of uh, the movement of oil by rail and and uh, and road, um, including a lot of American oil in in the Bakken area of the Dakotas uh, that would have uh, piggybacked on Keystone. So uh, we're clearly disappointed. Uh, it won't affect relations with Canada. This has been done once before, uh, and, uh, and the Trudeau government, notwithstanding its, its support of Keystone, uh, got along famously with the Obama administration in the last year after, after KXL was nixed the first time, and I have to think it's going to get along famously with the Biden administration as well. Thanks very much. Sarah, I've got some um, questions that relate to historical perspectives. How do the foreign policy challenges that Biden inherits compare with other presidents? What achievements under the Biden administration would make future historians see his presidency as transformational? I guess for me, the first comparison that comes to mind in terms of what's a historical precedent for something like what Biden is facing strikes me as 9-11 um, in that the response of the United States to 9-11 um, was multi-pronged and involved um, a massive investigation into the sort of intelligence, law enforcement, um, all of the different ways in which the U.S. government failed to prevent this attack. And when I think about the ways in which COVID has ravaged the United States in contrast to other countries, it seems to me as though a Biden-led US government needs to take on um, a rethinking of so many different aspects of US policy, whether it's um, its engagement with the world on global health, um, the ways in which the United States supply chains are dependent upon relationships and the flow of of um, goods and people from other countries. Um, and so for me, it seems like both were kind of um, existential crises for the United States in terms of shaking the country's confidence um, about its ability to protect uh, the American people 
um, and to give them confidence that they would be safe going forward. And so to me, the, although the threats are very different, um, I think that both require a really rethinking of the way in which the US government engages externally, but also um, with the American people at home. What would be a sort of an achievement that would signal that Biden's administration was transformational? Um, I mean, I think a lot of what people are talking about in, in Washington, at least, is this question of how much um, Biden is, is gonna go back uh, to the policies of, of the Obama administration. And I think what we will see as transformational is if actually he pushes the place of the United States um, forward um, in, a, in a way that's meaningfully different from the policies that were pursued under, under the Obama administration. Thank you. Um, George, question coming in about the role that the US can play in cooperation with China to actually get underneath the vast global economic inequality. So China in one sense is an exemplar country having removed some 500 million people out of extreme poverty over three decades or so. So what, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think, I think it's, it's difficult. On the one side, we had um, sort of like active efforts under the Trump administration to go into the other direction, right? So economic decoupling from China, um, pressuring US allies um, in Europe, for example, to remove Huawei from developing 5G networks. Um, and I think this suspicion when it comes to sort of like Chinese-led state capitalism and how much, for example, the national security organs in China are involved with certain technology corporations, that is still very much an ongoing national security concern for the United States. So I think economic engagement is maybe not the absolute first priority of the Biden administration. I think there will be a rollback of some of the punitive tariffs um, that the Trump administration has sort of like put on China, which were actually hurting you know, farmers and, and consumers in the United States itself. Um, I think that will already improve some of the atmospherics. But I think when it comes to economic engagement and cooperation, the Biden administration will first look to actually democratic allies uh, and partners also as part of this idea of you know, legal democracies or a democracy summit. So I think the first port of calls here will be, as I said, probably rejoining the success of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, maybe re reviving efforts for a transatlantic uh, trade and investment deal, but I don't see, you know, also sort of like symbolically Biden uh, turning first to Be Beijing here for a major, um, major effort also because the enthusiasm for free trade deal, I think, has cooled quite considerably, not just in the Republican Party, but also in the Democratic Party. You know, the unions were never a big fan of, of NAFTA, for example. And so when Biden will invest political capital into free trade or uh, renegotiation here, then not first with China. Thanks very much. Roy, lots of questions coming in on Russia. So with Russia's more assertive approach in general and its increasing interference, specifically in the Balkans, um, will the US become more engaged again in places like Kosovo and Bosnia, Herzegovina? Um, and also, uh, you know, do you think that uh, Biden will take actions against Russia for its alleged interference in American elections? I absolutely think that they'll take actions against Russia for their cyber interference of uh, during the course of, of 2020. Um, uh, and they will uh, try to be uh, to shine a light uh, so as to introduce uh, transparency and awareness about the extent of, of Russian involvement. Uh, as much of that is about educating Americans uh, uh, of, that, uh, of that phenomenon uh, that was downplayed, of course, uh, for obvious reasons by, uh, by President Trump. Um, I don't know about the Balkans. I'd be a little bit more worried about the Baltics, actually. Um, uh, I, I think that there's a real risk here that, that uh, consistent with the point I made earlier, that Russia will try to test uh, America uh, on um, uh, you know, NATO um, Article 5, for example, its commitment, you know, we all stand together, um, which doesn't mean they necessarily 
attack Latvia, uh, but they uh, or or Lithuania or Estonia, but they they um, engage in in more meddlesome behavior of the eastern Ukraine prior to uh, prior to the attack um, uh, of a number of years ago. Um, and challenge Biden to, you know, put up or shut up. Um, uh, are you consistent with U.S. alliances uh, or are you opposed to uh, war and engagement uh, and try to make him look weak? Um, uh, and, and this, of course, you know, either way, <laughs> either outcome um, uh, is fodder for, uh, for opponents in the United States to try to, uh, to, try to undermine him. Th thanks. Um, Sarah, can I ask you a, a question that's coming in about the fragmented response by U.S. political leaders to the recent insurrection at uh, U.S. Capitol? Um, and what impact will this have on Biden government's global efforts overall and vis-a-vis uh, -vis global democratic development specifically? So I think that we've seen an evolution of the response. Um, to me, at this point, it doesn't seem as fragmented as there are clearly still a few prominent people who believe that their political future um, is tied to defending the actions of the former president. Um, but I'm not convinced that over time, one, um, as law enforcement investigations move forward, um, or as the work of Congress, particularly um, as the Senate begins its trial of Donald Trump, that that will necessarily be true. Um, I also think that if uh, Biden lives up to the promise that he made in the inaugural address yesterday to lead for all Americans, even those who didn't support him, um, we may see a greater spirit of coming together. And then the, the people who continue to defend the violence that was done against the Congress um, may find themselves increasingly isolated within American politics. Thanks, Sarah. George, um, questions coming in about the wall uh, that Trump promised between the U.S. and Mexico. What do you think the Biden administration will do with this unfinished project in the realm of U.S. relations with Latin America? Well, I think, you know, symbolically, we're already seeing a rollback of Trump's um, kind of like nativist informed immigration policy. I think one of the first executive orders he signed was to rescind the so-called uh, Muslim ban. Um, and also to rescind the emergency order that Trump passed to actually sort of like divert funds from the defense uh, budget to get the get part of the wall built. So I think the I think the wall will very much remain um, unfinished. Uh, I'm not quite sure if if the parts that have been you know finished so far will be torn down again because obviously it would. Um, produce additional additional uh, costs, but I think also. Um, Biden's uh, in this initiative um, uh, when it comes to the dreamers. So all of that, I think, will be a roll will, will be a rollback of of the Trump uh, of the Trump wall. Um, definitely on a policy on a policy level. And I think what remains, you know, with with the parts built, if they you know they are integrated or integratable with the existing border security systems, or if they will be dismantled altogether, which would of course be quite a powerful symbol in on itself, uh, having lived in Berlin where a wall came down to great effect. Uh, um, I think that could also send a powerful message, but that I think will come down a little bit on also the cost, the cost involved. Thanks very much. I just wanna put a question to all of you now, and I know there's still uh, questions in the Q&A and we'll do our best to get back to participants if you leave your emails with um, some insights on those questions. But can I finish the session with a really quick 15 seconds from all of you on what is your top takeaway for policymakers with the incoming administration? Roy, let's start with you. Um, there's so many policies, Anne, that are required. I'd actually, focus more on uh, attitude and style. Uh, the president, um, the new president projects uh, modesty and purposefulness and, uh, and moderation. Um, if he uh, is true to, if he walks his talk, uh, if he's true to that and works constructively with others, uh, if his administration follows his model, then I think that the United States will encounter great receptivity for um, re-engaged uh, U.S. leadership in the world. Thanks very much. George, over to you. Ten seconds. Something 
um, that I would like to see is a bit more humility in US foreign policy discourse after these last four years to maybe tone down the rhetoric a bit on American exceptionalism and to present the United States more as an indispensable partner among others rather than the one single indispensable nation. Sarah. I think that the Biden administration needs to recognize that the world has changed in the last four years and that just going back to the pre-Trump playbook won't be sufficient. Thank you. Thanks to all panelists. Uh, it was a great, great session. I hope everybody enjoyed that discussion. And I hope you'll all join us next week, same time, same day, and same link for a look at leadership and legitimacy in a post-pandemic Latin America. Until then, thank you so much. Take care and stay safe.